All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I think the volume is now down. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we'll speak loud. So um, uh, again, uh, I know I've already introduced myself to everybody that is here in person. My name is Ted Iber. I'm the executive director for the St. Louis Literary Award. Sounds like my ride is here. I'm let that pass for a second. Um, so welcome to Campus Read uh, Book Talk number two. So I'm gonna give you some, just a, a little bit of background on what to expect tonight. <laughs> And I've got Emmy and Ariana behind me who are also going to be doing some of the introductions. Um, so today, and, and I wish I didn't have to read my notes, but I do have to read my notes. So today we are excited to bring you uh, the second of our eight Campus Read Book Talks uh, focused on the work of the 2023 St. Louis Literary Award recipient, Neil Gaiman. And he's gonna be coming to town and I'm gonna probably say this again on April 13th and April 14th. Um, He's going to be, in fact, uh, on the 13th, he'll be at the Sheldon Concert Hall, and that will be at 7 p.m. Central Time. And then he'll be at Bush Student Center on St. Louis University's campus on April 14th at noon. Tickets go on sale February 10th at 10 a.m. Central Time. And I bring that up because I have set a strong suspicion that they're gonna sell out quickly. So uh, get ready to push those buttons. If you've ever signed up for like right. uh, Disney or something and you're trying to get online uh, to get a ticket reserved, it's kind of like that if, uh, if you have a chance to do it. So uh, let's see here. Uh, and I believe one, if not both events will be moderated by our hometown boy and actor, John Hamm. So he will be in town for that as well. Yeah, we're really thrilled to have him back. Uh, all right, so tonight's discussion is led by Martin Casas, who is the owner right here of Apotheosis Comics and Lounge, and Drew Kupski. I'm going to introduce both of them in just a few minutes. Uh, and the presentation is called Enter Sandman. Martin and Drew will walk attendees through the history and themes of comics as they parallel American history. The discussion will trace the origins of comics through the decades and how they speak for each generation they're in. Culminating in the late 1980s, as a young comic writer, uh, Neil Gaiman enters the genre and redefines comics for decades to follow. The discussion will provide comic artwork from important works, and we will take questions from the audience both here and online. And now I'm going to pass the mic off to Ariana, who on the other side of me. There you go. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Ariana McGathis and I'm a communication major at SLU and also a student worker at the St. Louis Literary Award. So before we get to the book talk, we do want to mention that we feature many events throughout the year that are free and open to the public under the umbrella of the St. Louis Literary Award series of programs. We will post a link to the homepage if you would like to learn more about what we have going on and how you can be involved and even consider becoming a library associate member of the St. Louis Literary Award Program. We would also like to thank four of our sponsors, the St. Louis Community Foundation, Left Bank Books, Polly's Coffee Roasting Company, and of course, Apotheosis Comics and Lounge. The St. Louis Community Foundation inspires purposeful philanthropy that connects community and donors to build and preserve a more equitable and vibrant region, now and forever, with more than $770 million granted since 1974. Left Bank Books is the oldest and largest independently owned bookstore in St. Louis, and they offer a full line of new and used books, gifts, cards, magazines, toys, and services. Left Bank also offers a 20% discount on the works of this year's Literary Award recipient, Neil Gaiman, and you my fellow student worker, Emmy. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Emmy. I'm a health science major at SLU, and I'm a junior, and I'm also a student worker for the St. Louis Literary Awards program. Um, a profound thanks to another fabulous partner, Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company. No Caldi's Coffee is dedicated to creating what? a magical coffee experience for the customers oh, and committing to sustainable business practices, providing educational opportunities, and supporting the communities that they serve. I'll also add that we have the St. Louis Literary Awards blend coffee that you can order. Hot you off the press. That's right. Or hot off the roaster. And it's also fitting that Apotheosis Comics celebrates its grand opening right when Superman turns 80. And the values of Apotheosis Comics um, reflects those of the man. Well, sure, big deal. Yeah. Betty Schaefer, because she lives in Park Grove, who this book I was telling about this. She said, I love that story. Tremendous need to show people that there's altruism, there's integrity, 
And there's so Hannah Klein's brother not just but store, it's a store, it's a gathering place. And at the heart of Apotheosis Comics is service to the community. The store frequently organizes food drives, neighborhood cleanups, and voter registration events. Apotheosis is glad to be here and they're just getting started. Oh, thanks. See, the camera, it's backwards. So I, I totally can't do things backwards. Uh, <laughs> All right, so I wanted to introduce uh, Martin and Drew tonight. We're really excited that they are uh, doing this presentation. Martin, this is such a such an incredibly cool store. Thank you. Uh, as I tell people, uh, it is eye candy when you walk in here. So uh, for those of you who are not here, uh, if you're online, come check out Apotheosis either right, uh, we're on South Grand right now, but there's also a location on Cherokee Street. Um, it is just wonderful books, uh, uh, graphic novels, comic books. And it's a bar. So uh, everybody's drinking uh, right in front of me right now. So you Zoomers. <laughs> yeah, so it's fantastic. So Drew um, Kupski is our digital resources librarian at SLU. He has an MA in applied analytics from St. Louis University and his MLS in library science from the University of Missouri, Columbia. He's been at SLU since 2006. Drew, you look way too young to be uh, there for so long. And has curated several exhibits on comics and graphic novels for Pius Library. Uh, he's an avid reader and a collector of comics for uh, over 20 years. And so is Martin, by the way. No surprise there. So please welcome Drew Kupski and Martin Casas. Okay. Are you guys there? Good evening. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Can you hear me? Echoes up way high. There we go. All right. Hello? Gotcha. All right. Good day. Hi, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, so my name is Martin Costas. Thank you for coming to my store. A couple of housekeeping things. The bar is open. Elon will serve you. Happy to help. Bathrooms in the back. And uh, you are in Missouri's only comic book store bar, one of only five in the country. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you out here to talk about uh, you know, the history of Neil Gaiman. Actually, if you're on, if you knew this, but when you, did you know as much about Sandman before you started this thing? I knew some about it from having read it, but it had been a long time since I read anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it, and it's, you know, and just reading it again, I started again, actually, not that long ago, between uh, Neil Gaiman coming to SLU and uh, the Sandman TV show that just started on Netflix. Yes. And so I just started rereading it, and yeah, it is so good. It's great. Um, so one thing we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the importance of Sandman, not only for the comic book medium, but also for uh, the literary community as a whole. Um, and the first thing I want to do here, so this is a question we get a lot when we come in here. This is a comment we get a lot when we come in here is that people say, uh, I've never read a comic book before, and I have no idea how to read a comic book. How many people in here have read a comic book or graphic novel before? Okay, wonderful. Um, for the rest of you who haven't, and for our audience out in uh, the internet land, um, we're going to start off this, this whole conversation before we get into the history of comics about how to read a comic, uh, because it will, understanding how you read a comic will help you understand what a, a, an incredible art form it actually is. You guys ready to do some clicking? Okay. All right. So first of all, a comic book is composed of about between, at the very minimum, 22 to could be 120 pages. Uh, obviously, it's got the page. Uh, each page is broken up into a, any number of panels, which is B, the frame, which establishes the gutters, and the area you're going to talk, which is basically the border, uh, the word bubble, and then, of course, uh, it's the word bubble, the word bubble is D. Uh, and then the gutters, which help you uh, pass time throughout the comic. Think of the gutters as uh, frames of a movie, uh, like a film, film reel. Comics are read left to right, top to bottom. There's an example of a six panel page, but not all comics are equal because there's also manga, which is becoming one of the most popular uh, forms of uh, graphic literature out there. Uh, they are read left, I'm sorry, right to left, uh, 
I guess, back mm -hmm. backwards to front. So yeah. we have a whole selection. That's because that is the way the Japanese uh, uh, language is written and comics are adapted to it as well. The Hebrew? Mm -hmm. uh, understanding how a page, how page paneling, pacing, and use of structure uh, build the comic book experience. So gutters pass time between actions. It's up to the reader to create the sequence and fill in the story as they go. In doing so, readers become a part of the story and build out the world themselves. The artists are responsible for creating the content in the frames that help you know what's happening. However, if you look at the first panel here, this is from The Dark Knight Returns, the origin of Bruce Wayne. Uh, this is when his parents were shot in uh, a crime alley. You can see in the first panel, it's a simple hand. The second panel, it's a clenched fist. You don't know, I mean, you in your mind, you have to put that together. As the series goes on, uh, paneling, it explains the entire story without saying any words whatsoever. But the gutters are how you uh, transition between time. Same thing here. This is from um, Batman, the... Uh, oh, God, that's embarrassing. The killing Joke, yes. The Killing Joke, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, another two great uh, British creators, Brian Boland and Alan Moore. Another example of how you use the frames and gutters to uh, pass time. Blah, blah, blah. Also here, the size of the panels also can help you dictate the emotion and the uh, vibrancy of the page. You see here, this is where the Joker takes off his helmet for the first time and he re reveals his skin and goes insane. And uh, the last panel there is meant to expand on those uh, six panel uh, sequences at the top. And uh, the explosive panel at the bottom breaks the norms because there is no uh, uh, borders on that panel and his arms are exposed outside of it, meaning he has broken free of all sense of normalcy. Yeah, and also, Mark, there's, yes. uh, there's a great book out here, uh, Understanding Comics by yes. Scott yes. McCloud, yes. which is an excellent book and it's written in comic book form about understanding comics. It's right there in the title. <laughs> but uh, one of the lines I always remember is it talks about uh, the gutters as uh, a visual trapeze mm -hmm. where your eye swings from one to the next and your imagination uh, works to keep up and connect the dots and fill in the gaps from one image to the next. That would have been a great quote to put up here. Uh, <laughs> this is from uh, the man himself, Neil Gaiman. Uh, the magic of comics is there are three people involved in any comic. There's whoever's writing it and whoever's drawing it. And there's whoever's reading it because they are creating the movement. They're creating the illusion of time passing. Example here, uh, this is from Hulk comic, a spaceship traveling through time. It starts off on the left as you travel. You know that the ship is moving because each panel is broken up as uh, time passing and you're moving through the panel. Next one here is of the Incredible Hulk transforming. So the panel structure is broken up. Uh, panel pacing, a well-paced page will illustrate the verbs of the story. So any kind of action you have, this is a uh, six panel uh, page sequence from The Incredible Hulk, all four, my God, uh, I'm not hydrated enough today. Uh, you can see here he's getting ready to charge up his hammer. Uh, they kind of keep the page, the panels uh, big enough to kind of show the action, but then as they go on to the next page, they use that top panel there to evoke the power that Thor is using. But then you go to the bottom, it repeats a four panel sequence where uh, the images get tighter, the, it shrinks in on Thor's expression on his face to help you understand that as you're turning the page, you get oh. this, the mighty celestials, a larger one than he's ever fought before uh, is before him. And uh, that is just a gorgeous page right there. Uh, disrupting, disrupting the traditional page structure evokes different states of mind, tension, and timing. Just like the Joker in The Killing Joke, you can tell where uh, he broke the panel structure. Here's an uh, image from a page from The Flash where uh, a lot of tension, uh, he's falling through the sky, it's, underwriting. Underwriting. It's, an artist. it's intense, you don't know where to go. Uh, it's kind of spiraling down to a conclusion at the end, uh, but you're still reading. Uh, left to right, and then down, and add to each 
you know, how you decide to read that page also helps uh, evoke uh, intense unease and uh, nerves. Here's another great page from X-Men. Another great picture. This one here is, as you can see, it starts off on the left-hand side, and you've got uh, BF Beast falling through the sky. Then you have to zip up to the top, and as he's falling down again, you see the, the uh, fear in his face, and then you have to go right back up again to the top of the page. That un uneasiness that the panel creates. From dream sequences and other, for dream sequences and other out-of-body scenes, much like you're going to be seeing the Sandman, uh, removing the comforts of a structured page helped create a sense of unease. So here's a woman who's uh, waking up and her mind is, she's trying to get her memories correct. I think we've all felt like this. I felt like this this morning. <laughs> here's a great page from the Sandman where he uses the arteries of the heart to uh, serve as the, the gutters and the panels as well. Uh, understanding page structure, layout, and pacing allows the writer and artist to create scenes that cannot be created in other mediums. Uh, this is especially true. I mean, co comics is, you can, what would take $20 million to do in a movie, comics can do on the page. This is by Neil Gaiman himself. So this is Metamorpho, uh, the element man. And the task that Neil set out here was to create a uh, story based on the first two letters of the uh, periodic table of elements. So here is Metamorpho and, or running through the periodic table of elements. You can see the capitalized letters there are the uh, letters on the uh, periodic table. And it ends with at the very bottom of the page there. Um, this is a page that, you know, so much happening, but it's so engaging that you want to follow. And then, you know, it's, uh, that is a, that, that's two masters, Mike Albert and uh, Neil Gaiman, who know exactly how to use the comic medium to its full effect. Uh, comic Walk, this is Graham Morrison, another UK uh, writer uh, came over during the big Vertigo days. A comic will always be more personal than a DVD or CD, both of which require electronic players to decode their content with comics. The reader is the player, so the engagement with the material is always more fundamental and dynamic. Reading comics is a much less passive activity than consuming CDs or DVDs. And don't feel bad about if you can't read comics or they're hard for you because this dude here, no oh dang, uh, Tim Burton, uh, who wrote, directed Batman, created Batman, did not read comics either. Um, he wrote, uh, created one of the best uh, comic movies of all time. Comics are art museums. If you rush through and only read the descriptions, you'll miss out on the whole experience. Comics is a um, dual purpose. One is you have to read the books and you have to enjoy the artwork to get the whole meaning of the story. Case in point, books like this, uh, words at the bottom, all the art. As you explore the page and kind of go through the nuances of what the artist created, the story becomes more rich. You find more details. Uh, there's more of the story that's drawn out. Uh, this is a page from uh, Prophet, Gigantic Space War. Uh, the detail shown in this page, uh, the story that it lays out, um, and the immensity of the page is um, it gives the experience of you're in, you're in the book. I'm sorry, you're in the story. It's super gross. <laughs> I was in Spider-Man Day in the Life. And then the, these pages where they just have, uh, you know, Easter eggs all over the place uh, by the great late George Perez uh, adds more. The story tells you more of what happened and how badly all these superheroes were killed in a uh, alternate reality story. Uh, then here, Sandman, I mean, they're really good at this. So this is uh, Morpheus in the middle, Sandman with a different abstract dream. You can see the different artist interpretation of each um figment of the the dreaming and um you know there's so much detail and nuance to look at there that oh, it's, it's beautiful different styles and coloring mm -hmm. um i love it so that is let's see i hope i remember this correctly ah so that's how you read a comic um we'll get more back into it later but well, let's skip on to the golden age all right so the golden age of comics heroes with you know, special abilities have been 
part of a bird culture for pretty much forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there have always been certain characters and, you know, it, but the superhero as we know, it sort of started a little before comic books with uh, what were known as the science heroes of the 1920s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And so we had characters like uh, Doc Savage and The Shadow and mm -hmm. other characters of that era who were either written in radio shows or in yes. novels. You have to remember that this time in the, the Gold Age of Comics took place roughly between the, eight, the years 1925 when science comics were most prominent to about 19, well, 1955. Uh, during that time, though, the majority of the creators were living in cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, New York. So the world outside their windows were filled with slums, corruption, uh, mobsters. So those were the villains and those were the people that they fought against and their heroes had to be able to defeat them. So the all they knew at the time was to create these heroes, like the science heroes were daring men of science. They had guns, they, you know, they were, uh, they traveled the world um, because that's what they saw around them. And that's the comics that were created at the time. Uh, what we didn't know is that they were creating modern American mythology as well. Mm -hmm. And the first real comic book superhero is, yeah, and there's some of the uh, older science heroes who were done in <laughs> magazines or novels <laughs> before comics. And yeah, this is. Well, actually, this, so this, this is a fun fact. So uh, we're getting to uh, the first hero, you guys. Who knows Superman? If you don't know Superman, why are you here? But um, so Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, two um, Jewish American teenagers in Cleveland, Ohio. And the first time that Superman was created uh, was in a 1935 story called The Reign of the Superman, which was about a man who was pulled out of the bread line, uh, given some special drugs and ingredients, and became corrupted by the power to be able to control the men's minds. And um, that was the character. So that was the first rendition of Superman. And then it was since in 1938, when they tried it again, uh, he became the hero we know, you know, know today. Um, and in fact, those heroes, um, here we go. So Superman, Action Comics 19, uh, 1938. Um, you'll see here Superman's lines, more powerful than lo locomotive, able to, able to leap uh, tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, those were the things that in 1938, regular Americans could comprehend as the most powerful things that people could overcome in their time. So in this first image, Action Comics 1, he's lifting a car over his head. Um, you can see the men running in terror behind him. Um, but in the first issue, who Superman fought wasn't aliens or monsters. He was trying to get uh, a wrongly convicted man off death row. He was trying to prevent a um, slumlord from throwing people out of their homes. And he was per, uh, you know, pursuing corruption at City Hall. Um, Superman was created as a hero of his time because that is what were the, that those were the issues of, of, of their era. Yeah, and this is him breaking down the door of the governor's house to force him to sign a stay of execution for an innocent man on death row. And this is one of my favorite uh, covers ever. Cap the very first well. captain. America by mm -hmm. Joe Simon and the great Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it uh, starts off with Captain America punching Hitler right in the face. Mm -hmm. And this, this came out in uh, December of 1940. Mm -hmm. So just Format about a year, war. yeah. So about a year before America went to war with Germany. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jack Kirby, as uh, a Jewish American, and I believe his parents were immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, he had very strong opinions about uh, Nazi Germany and what America should be doing. And so he, long before uh, America was actually at war, he had Captain America 
fighting Nazis. Uh, here's another fun fact. So before, uh, I think we all know that like the Nazi party wasn't exactly a disliked party before we entered the war in America. And uh, there's a lot of uh, supporters of Adolf Hitler in America and of uh, you know, German descent. Uh, Jack Kirby gets a phone call at Atlas Comics, which was what Marvel's called before then. The guy says, hey, I don't like how you're talking about um, the leader of my country, Germany. I'm going to come fight you. And Jack Kirby says, I'll meet you in the lobby. <laughs> so he went down there and he kept getting phone calls and he would respond to people uh, on a daily basis who did not like his characterization of Adolf Hitler. Scrappy guy. <laughs> um, so through the, let's see, where else, where, how are we doing the golden age? So again, you know, all these heroes, uh, this is the original Sandman from uh, 1940, blah, blah, blah. Um, and character, the Sandman was a character that shot uh, sleeping gas in people's faces and they fell asleep and um, that was his bad. You know, back in these days, the comics weren't meant to be thought provoking um, media pieces. They were meant to be quick entertainment for people trying to escape the drudgery of waiting in a bread line, looking for a job, waiting at the newsstand. Um, and so the comics and the colors and all that very pedestrian. And I mean, this is the dude in a suit and a purple cape with red gloves. Like none of that matches. He <laughs> looks a mess, but he survived. Ah, here we go. So, so we're now in the uh, America during World War II, um, poverty, people going to war, uh, kids you know, being, being drafted. Um, you know, uh, the New Deal was right around the corner. And uh, comic heroes were still fighting the tangible. They were fighting, uh, you know, communism and Hitler and, and all the things that you could see outside your door. Yeah. And especially after the war, when they were, I think, very much associated with, you know, superheroes are for either punching Hitler or catching either Nazi or Soviet spies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the 1950s, uh, comics made a uh, pivot away from superheroes and into the horror genre, um, mostly because uh, it was a escape from the, um, the story that, you know, just the, the, the terrors of, of, you know, modern life, um, of dealing with communism and of the nuclear bomb. Um, do we, so actually we want to get to, I guess we're talking, okay, so. <laughs> So the 1950s comics and superhero comics were on such uh, a lifeline that only three heroes uh, survived. So uh, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. That was the only superheroes ever that existed at the time. The majority of the comics were true crime and they were horror books. Um, and uh, <laughs> this cover here, Crime Suspense Stories, was the nail in the coffin of comics because uh, this was what got a guy named Frederick Wortham, I'll let you talk about that guy, um, Frederick Wortham to concoct an entire scheme about why comics are bad for kids. And um, this line of, 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 of stories, you can see, you know, I don't think we could, we could probably share that one, but that middle one there would be, that, that would be very hard to sell today. But um so comics were in a rough space in the 1950s because of not only the subject matter, but also because of a guy named Frederick Wortham. Yeah, and Frederick Wortham was a uh, professor of psychology at, I believe, Harvard. And he wrote a book about comics called Seduction of the Innocent. And uh, the St. Louis University Library actually had a copy until it got it actually got stolen not that long ago. Where did you but, put it? Where did you put it? Not me, I promise. But uh, anyway, uh, so Seduction of the Innocent was a book all about how uh, comics were corrupting children. And he did all this research and interviewed all of these children and wildly edited his data until it said what he wanted it to say, which was that it uh, it was causing all kinds of crime and leading kids to drop out of school anyway, and promoting homosexuality yeah. and all sorts of other things. And so that prompted a uh, congressional hearing. Incidentally, for those of you who uh, read a couple of years ago in our uh, 
campus read was the adventures of cavalier and clay yeah the uh congressional hearings towards the end of that book were real and prompted by frederick here yeah which that led to you know, almost the near annihilation of the medium except for a self-governing body that was created by comic creators themselves called the comic code authority so the general rule was that comics had to follow uh these simple rules no sex no drugs no cursing no nudity the words terror and weird were banned from comic book titles. Right. Additionally, cops always had to be right and correct, and villains always had to lose. These rules supposedly ensured the avoidance of tainting America's youth with sex, drugs, villainy, and communism, especially. Um, I, I didn't turn you away from communism. Yeah. I'm, I'm, just kidding. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so the Comic Code Authority uh, survived for. Better, that's a note here later. So we'll talk about it later. But it's, uh, this is what saved the comic book industry um, for a while, which gave birth to the Silver Age. Yes, I love the Silver Age. Me too. <laughs> and the Silver Age began in 1956 mm -hmm. with uh, the reboot of a new Flash comic. Mm -hmm. And it was soon followed by a bunch of others. And sorry, sorry, I, I pushed the button too fast. And sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. And also, meanwhile, as the Silver Age was getting going with a new generation of superheroes, uh, Neil Gaiman, as you can see here, adorable little Neil Gaiman. Yes, was a, I guess part of that same generation. Yes, as he was born at the same time in Portchester, England. So around this time, remember. So now we're talking about 1961. So what's going on in 1961? We got the nuclear bomb. We have the threat of communism. We've got the space races starting. We've got advancements in medicine and science and physics. So, was so anyone comics are now moving away day, yeah. from yeah. heroes that need to stop trains and trucks and run faster than Cheetah to being able to survive the atomic bomb and flying into space. Uh, by this time, Superman uh, was now able to not only uh, film atomic uh, explosions for the military. He was able to survive them and fly to the sun and back. Um, so the heroes were adapting to the times. At this time, um, in 1956, with showcase number four, I believe it was, it was the rebirth of Flash um, from the last 1940s. Flash had some kind of goofy looking hat on and some dumb boots. Now he had a sleek red outfit. Uh, he could fly, uh, run faster than the speed of sound because we knew what that was now because of the advancements in, in uh, jet propulsion. We gave, we had uh, Green Lantern, who used to be a guy whose brain was uh, weakened by wood, which is mind blowing because everything's made of wood in the 1940s, to an intergalactic space cop who was a part of a uh, the Green Lantern Corps and went into space and explored different uh, planets. Um, to Metamorpho, the character you saw before, who was an elemental character, uh, Challenger of the Unknown, who explored into the Earth and outer space. Um, it was a time where comics moved away from the things that are tangible into the things that are scientific, and the characters had to meet the, uh, the challenge. Um, let's, I hope to God I have this right. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Which no one did better than these two. That's right. So this is everyone. Uh, seen a superhero movie in the last few years, you know, Stan Lee on the left, mm -hmm. who was the writer at Atlas and then something else and then Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. And the guy with the cigar was uh, Jack Kirby, mm -hmm. who created Captain America back in 1940, like we said. And now in the 60s with uh, Lee, he created dozens of characters that everyone knows now. They created the cat, uh, the Hulk, and uh, the Fantastic Four, and uh, Thor, Black Panther. You can see Namor there, uh, Silver Surfer, the original X Men. And yeah, th these two had a real run. I mean, early nineteen sixties. Uh, I mean, the, every comic book movie that you've seen today from Marvel, these two dudes, and all the major themes, these two guys created um, in yep. a short period of time. Um, and in fact. Stan Lee was about to quit comics um, because he was tired of writing crime and drama and romance books. And his wife said, 
well, just, just do one more story, and, but do it about something you, you, you care about and you love. And so he, he came up with the Fantastic Four. And the Fantastic Four was a group of uh, friends who flew into space. They got exposed to cosmic radiation. Uh, they all gained, you know, they're not up there, but they, they became the Fantastic Four. Um, and what he brought into that was a family dynamic that it didn't exist before in comics. Because of the comic code of authority and because of the pedestrian nature of comics, you know, heroes had to win, villains had to lose. But what Stanley and Jack Kirby did is they told the story in between all those instances of when the thing, who is the orange character on the top there next to Stanley, uh, see Stan on top of Hulk's shoulders, the thing became a monster. He didn't become a attractive hero like his uh, best friend or the Human Torch. Um, so he was cursed and angry with Reed for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, Spider-Man, regular kid. He had uh, problems, you know, with, with grades and getting to school and couldn't pay rent. Stanley and Jack Kirby brought into uh, comics for the first time real emotion and everyday problems that characters could, uh, readers could relate to. Yeah, and it is, and those, these are some of my very favorites because they are, for that exact reason, it's all, you know, it's material where, you know, some of it is ridiculous and usually in a good way. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, where there's things like, you know, one of the early Spider-Man issues where uh, he loses, the first time he loses the fight, it's because he has flu. Yes, and yeah, he can yeah. barely stand, yeah. let alone, you know, let alone get in a fist fight with Dr. Octopus. So now, and comics had this new wonder tool that they could use to create powers, radioactivity, which we didn't know about in the 1940s because the atomic bomb didn't exist. So in order for Americans to rationalize the terrifying nature of what radioactive materials were, what atomic bombs were, they had to create heroes that could deal with it. So you have the Incredible Hulk, who was uh, created during a gamma bomb, gamma bomb explosion, which is like a nuclear uh, bomb. Spider-Man was bitten by a radioactive spider. Um, of course, Fantastic Four. Iron Man was a, a weapons designer. Uh, who was kidnapped by the Viet Cong and had to create a, a suit of armor. Um, so these were heroes that were starting to be created to address the modern times that they lived in because we needed to be able to figure out a way to rationalize it and not fear it. Next one. I'm not really, I'm not, I'm, I'll get better with this. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, and so here, you know, these are two panels I found from two different books from Jack Kirby in 1961 or 62. And on the left, you can see Fantastic Four number one, where uh, they're planning to go and uh, steal a rocket ship so they can go into space before the commies get there. <laughs> oh, is that and, Fantastic Four number one? Yeah. Oh, okay. And so this is where Ben tries to tell them that uh, this is a terrible idea to break into an American army base and steal a rocket. And uh, Sue says, well, we've got to take that chance unless we want the commies to beat us. And then he gives in and does it and is in the horrible accident that makes him into the big orange rock monster. And on the right is from Hulk number one, where uh, Bruce Banner is exposed to gamma radiation by the bomb that he built himself for the military. Mm -hmm. So the Silver Age lasted roughly to about 1970, um, where, so we brought in emotions in the comics and we brought in the world outside of our door from the 1940s. The 1960s, there was a lot of stuff happening um, in America that again, we need to, fit, to figure out how to address. And so uh, in the 1970s, the Bronze Age dawned and um, it brought in a whole slew of social issues that comics needed to address. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, the first two images here are from uh, a DC book of the early 70s called Green Lantern and Green Arrow. And they are by uh, one of the all-time great artists, Neil Adams. Mm -hmm. and. A uh, writer named Denny O'Neill, who is a St. Louis University graduate, class of 1961. Hey, and 
So they were told to pair up these two characters who, other than they both wear green, they have basically nothing in common. <laughs> and so just to give them something to talk about, they decided that they would make Green Lantern more uh, traditional and conservative and make Green Arrow a liberal, just so they could have something mm -hmm. to argue about. <laughs> and they get into, and so this was the first issue or first series to really talk about a lot of social issues. Mm -hmm. And from the very first issue of it is that center section there where Green Lantern sees three teenagers threatening this old man on the street. And he grabs the ringleader of the group who is black and throws him in jail and comes back to check on the old man and finds out that he is the slum lord who uh, is about to throw all of their families out on the street and that uh, all of the people start throwing rocks at him for having defended the slip, the slum lord. And this uh, one old man tells him, I've been reading about how you saved the blue people and how on a planet somewhere you saved the orange skinned people, but what have you ever done for uh, the black people from here, just on the other side of your own city? And Green Lantern has no answer for it. And the next issue here, the Amazing uh, Spider-Man 96, Stan Lee was hired to do a uh, informational comic book about the dangers of drug abuse. And the story he wrote was so offensive, I guess, to the Comic Code Authority that they said you couldn't run it. Stan Lee says, I'm running it anyways. So this was the first book of the comic era that was published without the Comic Code Authority and pretty much started leading to the demise of comics. This was 1971 or two right here. Um, so this, and what's interesting about this is though, is that you'll notice over here in the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, it does have the Comic Code Authority right under the arrow there, the little tag. This one does not. And it kind of goes to show you the ambiguity of the Comic Code Authority at the time. It was a self-governing body of comic creators who let one slide, not the other. Um, and so it was kind of one of those things where it, was, it just really didn't serve a lot of a purpose. Um, at this time, am I going to do it right? Oh, oh, no, no, this no, uh, sort of uh, one of the starting points of the Bronze Age again with Jack Kirby. Because mm -hmm. uh, there really is no way to talk about this stuff without Jack Kirby. We but, could, but we'd be bad at our jobs. Yeah. Uh, is he quit Marvel in 1960 and seven, seven. Or 70, excuse me, 1970. And so he uh, was immediately hired by DC and started his own uh, set of four interconnected stories, which became known as the Fourth World. And as Martin was saying before about comics being a modern mythology, Kirby wanted to do that as literally as possible. Yeah. To the point where he made his, the fourth world is a story about superpowered aliens who call themselves the new gods. And the good gods live on one planet and the bad gods live on another and they've been at war That's for forever. Is. Yeah. Mark, guys. And so this yeah. is a uh, super town. The, Flying city on New Genesis, the good planet. Yeah, and this is, I think, his commentary on like youth culture at the time. So mm -hmm. this is very dated from a guy whose heyday was the 1940s, about how he interpreted kids in the 70s and 60s, but did a hell of a job. It's really creative yeah, artwork. Yeah. It's very weird, but incredibly good. Very weird and incredibly good is right. Yeah. Uh, at this time, John <laughs> Hamm was born in 19 in St. Louis, 1971. There he is right there, cute little mm -hmm. guy. Um, I think, I hope this next panel has to do with, oh, well, we're going to get in that soon. But the last big thing from the 1970s and the Bronze Age of comics, or the early age of Bronze Age, was the introduction of Giant Size X-Men. So this was a team that brought in the international group of heroes. So for the first time, we had heroes outside of our borders fighting for American causes. Uh, we had a character, Storm, who's from Africa. Nightcrawler from Germany, uh, Colossus from Russia, uh, Wolverine from Canada, that doesn't really count, but whatever, Canada, <laughs> and uh, Sun Sunfire, Sunfire Sun 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 from Japan. So, um, H, and then he also had Warpath, 
uh, native, uh, in, uh, an indigenous uh, creator character. Um, and so the X Men were also important because they were analogies for describing racial conflict in America. Uh, they are characters that were born with their powers and they're hated for it. Um, so much like at this time, uh, you know, the way that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee could explain racial tension was through the, through the lens of superheroes, right? So, uh, you know, you know what it's like being an African-American in a country because just like these kids were born with powers, they are persecuted for just being born this way. Um, and then with the giant size X-Men, they kind of took it into a whole new realm. Yeah, and there was a lot new of, you know, like Martin said, a real focus on new uh, diversity and, you know, really leaning into the metaphor of, you know, mutants as marginalized people. Yes, right. And so with, with that, um, that leads us up to about 1980, 1982. Um, a lot of the comic book fans of the 1960s, like our young friend Neil Gaiman, born in uh, Worcester, England, mm -hmm. is now 20 years of age. He's been reading comics. He's been trying to get involved in, in uh, uh, becoming a writer. Uh, but this leads up to the uh, dark age of comics, which really was kind of was pressed, was you know, highlighted by the policies of Margaret Thatcher in the U.S. and the U.K., Reagan in the U.S. Um, and, um, oh, that's not going to come out right, but sorry. So would you like to talk about the Dark Age of Comics? Sure. And what? I never got one. See, this was <laughs> where, that's you know, not you know <laughs> writers of the 70s, like Denny exactly. O'Neill and Jack Kirby, were trying to get more socially conscious with their work. But it didn't always work well mm -hmm. because, you know, it was very stilted and they were still working. They were also, you know, not Kirby especially was not the right age to really be yes. getting what was going on. And so, you know, he was a 50 something year old man trying to understand, you know, the counterculture of the late 60s and early 70s. And he tried really hard and supported it in theory, but didn't always get there yeah but now getting into the 80s and you know with a newer generation of especially uh frank miller and in the uk alan moore mm -hmm. if if the 1960s were summarized as the comics response to america being a superpower the 80s are summarized as comics as the response to uh, America having too much power, um, and the UK. Well, this is see, this is what happens. You have a skilled uh, slideshow guy doing this job. So, uh, and the new team. You know, so, the, the the question of can absolute power corrupt absolutely is the question that Alan Moore tried to address with Miracle Man. Miracle Man was a character that was ripped off actually from Captain Marvel in the 1960s in the UK. Um, and then when DC Comics found out about it, they sued them. So they had to change the name to Miracle Man. They just changed the colors and literally the books just kept going out. I swear to God, that's how that character started. So what ended up happening though was that uh, Frank Alan Moore took him over in the late eighties and then really used as an example to say, if you had the power of Superman, because look at what, how Margaret Thatcher and how the UK government is reacting, they would be so distant from the people that he would act like a god and wouldn't know how to even deal or talk to um, um, regular man. Saga of the Swamp Thing, hiding in the back there, was another book by Alan Moore, but a character called Swamp Thing, who is um, kind of the response to environmentalism or lack thereof of the 1980s. And then, of course, we've got... No! Oh! I'm, I'm going to get good at this thing. Well, actually, the, the, the folks at home, if you can go back one page for the folks at home, if you mind. So uh, then we had uh, Watchmen, which is a seminal order of time, which is about a team of superheroes who um, really kind of like, that's like a real, Alan Moore's, I think you could cap it off with Miracle, uh, Marvel, uh, Mr. Miracle and, and Watchmen. Um, and then along came in the U.S., the response came from Frank Miller, who was a, care, a creator of, uh, the Dark Knight Returns, Batman Year One, and those are the two books that 
completely flipped the script on Batman. Because at the time, the only thing people knew about Batman, well, they didn't know about this, but the most popular example of Batman was the 1960s campy, you know, show where he always won. Um, Frank Miller took that story on its head and really used it to explore what authority was and how authority is corrupted and abused and how if you can have one man you can that, that can be the savior for it or for uh you know whatever he um maybe it's something to aspire to but so we had two stories happening one was about what absolute power does and how it corrupts it absolutely and for america this overwhelming sense of of authority um there we go yeah and also as we mentioned there this was also uh the age of it's not a superhero comic, obviously, but uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which was a two volume graphic novel that won the Pulitzer Prize around this time, mm -hmm. based on uh, Spiegelman's uh, parents' experience in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we had we had Watchmen, we had um, uh, Swamp Thing, we had Dark Knight Returns. And so all, all these concepts of what superheroes and comic books are, are turning on their head. Um, and at this time, uh, while working as a journalist, uh, Gaiman discovers Alan Moore, or me Alan Moore, I should say, um, at a comic book convention, they become friends and he asks Alan Moore, can you write a comic? And Alan Moore shows him how to do it. Um, and then from there, uh, he went and uh, wrote, what was the name of this? Story one. Uh, Tharg's Future Shocks was the, uh, it was a feature in, uh, there's a long standing uh, British comic called 2000 AD, mm -hmm. which has been around forever and it's a science fiction anthology. But they had a feature called Tharg's Future Shocks where uh, new creators could essentially audition by doing like five page stories. And Here's so, another one. Yeah, and so here's Neil Gaiman's uh, entitled You're Never Alone with a Phone, which really interestingly, in 1988, he was talking about uh, people having portable computerized phones that uh, were distracting them and disrupting society. <laughs> yeah. What? How did that happen? Yeah. So. I have this book coming from the UK because I was, I was doing this thing like I always do is I went on eBay and I immediately bought it. So my wife's watching. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Don't look at the mail. Yeah, you know, in 1988, predicting, you know, the guy at the store on his phone saying, yes, dear, of course, I'll pick up a cauliflower on the way. <laughs> um, at this time, so now Neil Gaiman uh, has now, he's got some writing under his belt. So he's got one book, three titles, uh, Violent Cases. Uh, the comedy Mr. Punch, um, and then actually, I've never heard of Sigal. Do you know is it? Have you read that? I, I have never, I had heard of Mr. Punch, I had never read any of these before. But yeah, all of them are him, and so he's described as his favorite collaborator, Dave McKeon, mm -hmm. who uh has a very distinct style of art. He did all three of these covers, and in a little bit, he will be uh working with. Neil Gaiman, he did all of the original covers for uh, the Sandman. Mm -hmm. And so in night, so two big things happened in comics before this happened, uh, before the Sandman release. One was Jeanette Kahn was named uh, publisher of DC Comics in 1978, 79. Uh, it was the first woman to run a comic book company ever. And what Jeanette Kahn did is she focused on making sure that A, DC Comics was more a more fun place to work and their stories had more meaning. Uh, she hired a woman named Karen Berger, whose job it was to edit um, and find new talent. So uh, she discovered Alan Moore, brought him over and signed a contract and they brought Alan Moore for that stuff. While he was over, while she was over in the UK looking for new talent, Alan Moore said, you should really talk to this guy named Neil Gaiman. And she had a meeting with Neil Gaiman, and the rest is history. Um, so yeah, so really his, that, this is really the only thing he had in his pocket there. But so he got, um, 
So Karen Berger asked him to put a new spin on one of the publisher's oldest properties and uh, thought this Neil Gaiman fellow had some potential. And after a trial under a title, she gave Sandman the go-ahead in 1988. Uh, but you can tell here, so this is the, this cover here, normally this is how also Sandman kind of broke the, the, the barriers. That's the only time the main character appears on the cover of Sandman in the first issue. Um, normally the cut character is prominent in the middle. It is, he is the guy you see on every page, uh, sorry, on every cover. Uh, but Sandman is a story about stories. So it's not as important for the character to be on the cover. So this is my favorite thing about Sandman. So Karen Berger calls him and says, we want you to uh, reinvigorate a character of ours called the Sandman. The, the first character you see on the left here is the original Sandman from 1940s. The middle one is the Sandman from the 1960s, created by uh, um, Jack Kirby. You can tell and the last one is the most uh, popular and profitable uh, Sandman iteration at the end. Um, you can tell that clearly Neil Gaiman had his own ideas about what this character should be. Yeah. Uh, the look of Neil Gaiman, of Sandman was modeled after four people. One of them was uh, Lee Singer of the Cure. Uh, I forget this dancer's name in the middle, I apologize. And then also he's an amalgam of half a dozen guys that knew slightly an old punk club scene and didn't want to know any better. They were all tall, pale, beautiful, and serious sleaze bags who used women like toilet paper. Uh, artist Sam Keith of the first Sandman, he's the one that designed the look of Sandman. So throw those guys together, plus you throw in Neil Gaiman's face, and you got you got the same, you got Morpheus. Okay. And so these are and Sandman is, you know, a revolutionary series. It is, you know, as Martin said, it's a, a story about stories, and there are lots of different genres. He bring, you know, Gaiman, as Gaiman does all the time, brings in influences from everywhere to be in here. You know, you have you know, superheroes interacting with Greek and uh, Egyptian gods and Chinese folklore and all sorts of other things. But instead of, you know, Sandman being a superhero as he was in the first two versions, now his actual name is Dream of the Endless. And of the Endless is his, la is his family name. <laughs> and there are seven supernatural beings called the Endless. And this is him and uh, his older sister, Death. Mm. So there's, let's see if I can do this. Oh, Destiny, boy. Death, Dream, Desire, Despair, Destruction, and Delirium. Yeah, all characters, they're, they're after aspects of human nature. That's what yeah. they were. So relieved I could do that without writing it down. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, you're, you're very proud of me. You should be. I, you know, <laughs> um, fun fact. So Sandman is traditional character. So like I said, uh, like Bruce said, uh, Sandman is a amalgamation of a variety of different stories, folklores, and other characters. The original Sandman is, is a traditional character in many children's stories and books that we all know about. In Scandinavian folklore, he's said to sprinkle the sand or dust on or into the eyes of children at night to bring on sleeps and dreams. The grit or sleep in one's eyes upon waking is supposed to result in Sandman's work the previous night. However, in German, he threw sand in the eyes of children who wouldn't sleep when the result of that, their eyes falling out and being collected by the Sandman, who then takes the children to his iron nest in the moon and uses them to feed his children. So you can tell there's a lot of, a lot of material to drive from there yes. about that culture. Um, so, I think you were mentioning too about the, the family of the Sandman, but so the one thing of this, since Dream and his siblings are kind of unbounded by time and place, the storytelling possibilities for them are endless. About that. Just like the endless. And that's really what the Sandman is all about, stories and significance. Uh, there's a gripping serialized story about Dream's attempts to come to grips with change, but some of the most memorable entries are standalone tales that, um, Find people interacting with the Lord of Dreams. Yeah, and this is uh, first one we picked is uh, one of the most famous issues is called The Sound of Her Wings, which is the first issue uh, involving 
uh, dream or uh, yeah. excuse me, death. Who and it says a lot about the endless that uh, death is the nice one. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is uh, when Dream is sitting in the park moping and uh, his sister comes to uh, cheer him up and drag him along as she does her work of uh, collecting souls for the day. And so, and after seeing him as this, you know, like that guy there, you know, this very serious and brooding and dark, you know, mythical figure, and now he's sitting in the park feeling sorry for himself and death takes his breadcrumbs away and bops him on the head with it. What makes this issue significant is that it really showcases Neil Gaiman's ability to tell a story. Death is the optimistic one in this story. And what he ends up doing is he reframes the nature of death uh, by making it not something to be afraid of and how in death's endless life, the creation of the universe, it has had to deal with being the first person that a person sees when they die. And it was sad and it was heartbreaking, but death came to terms with her role in the universe and made it into something that is not only inevitable, but also doesn't have to be terrifying. It can be comforting because as she says in the book, death is, you ought to, uh, you ought to be greeted by a close friend not a terrifying um, enemy. And if there is one episode you watch of Sandman on Netflix, I ask you to please watch this one. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous piece of work. Oh yeah, this is, this is a great quote. And this is uh, Neil Gaiman's one sentence summary of all 75 issues and a couple thousand pages of uh, Sandman. Mm -hmm. is the Lord of Dreams learns that one must change or die, and he makes his decision. Yes. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is when Dream makes a friend, uh, which is also a great episode of the show already. But this is one of my favorite characters, is Hoff Gadling, this guy from a soldier from the 14th century who was sitting in a bar talking about how, uh, and he and his friends were joking about how he just wasn't going to die. People do it all the time because they think they're supposed to, but he's going to be the first to just not do it. And he doesn't know that dream and death overhear him and decide to see what's going to happen. And so he and dream start meeting in this same pub in London once every hundred years. And it's his first real, like, long-term interaction with an ordinary human. He knows every human who has ever lived on some level, but this is his, the first time he's actually sat down face-to-face -face with one of them for, you know, an actual real relationship and an actual friendship eventually. Yeah, the contrast here is that Dream can't die because he's a member of the Endless, and this man refuses to die, but he can experience life. So Morpheus is jealous and envious of the man who could die, and he wants to know why he wouldn't, why he won't choose to. It's a hell of a panel. Oh, the serial. Okay, yeah, I'm like, what is this panel for? Yeah, the the serial killer convention. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. And I'm not sure what we can even say about it beyond that, but yes, the serial convention. And you can see he had some fun with the spelling there. Yeah, get, and. So uh, the characters are on a road trip and end up stuck in this hotel with a convention full of like a hundred serial killers. Yeah, I think this one was about um, exploring man's like inhibitions and um, again, his dreams whole, he's trying to find out about humanity and life. And so this is about men's inhibitions to an extreme. And they use serial killers as an example. Of that. Yeah, and that nightmares are also a kind of dream. Mm -hmm. And these are, you know, terrible, terrible people who see themselves, you know, as speaking heroes. of stories, yeah. yeah, they have these stories about themselves as, you know, these fearsome and rugged individualists, which they're very much not, and they learn the hard way. This also is another good episode of that show. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
Oh, this is not this is, yeah, this is also and where uh, humans are not the only things that dream. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's called a dream of a thousand cats. Yes. Yeah. And so this is a great issue where we find out that cats also have dreams and they dream of a very different world than this one where they're not the ones who have to wear collars and yeah uh, yeah and they, i think they're they're giants and humans rub their bellies mm -hmm. for all eternity <laughs> um i think probably what's the next one here is oh this is a classic so in that same bar Pop Gapson, uh, he in the century two or three after maybe 200 years into it, he meets a young man talking about how he wants to create stories that will go on forever. Uh, his name is young Will Will Shakespeare. Yeah, Shakespeare. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, Hobbes says, oh yeah, that's Will. He's a uh, he's a playwright, but he's crap. Yeah. And so he actually makes a deal with Dream and is uh, commissioned to write A Midsummer Night's Dream because uh, more, because Dream owes a favor to the real Oberon and Titania. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, uh, as a favor to them, he gets Will Shakespeare to write a play about them that will, so that they will be remembered forever. And as it said at the bottom, it was, the first and only time that a comic book has won the World's Fantasy Award for Best Short Fiction. And I had read somewhere that uh, the day after the award ceremony, they changed the rules to specify no comic books allowed oh, because the award. some people were outraged that, you know, that a picture book could uh, be the best short fiction of the year. It's probably Neil Gaiman went on to write like a hundred amazing novels after yeah. Uh, so this is another great example of using comics uh, as an art medium. Uh, in the background, you've got the actors who are portrayed as like you know colorful, vibrant, uh, uh, living. In the center, you've got uh, Morpheus um, and what are their names? The king and queen. Uh, Oberon and Titania. I, Oberon and Titania um, in the middle, and then you've got the world of fairy behind in blue. And it's unreal and it's uh, scary. So you kind of see the level of um, theme there, where you know as you explore the artwork, it kind of dives deeper into the story. Yeah, and my favorite part of this one is the ending, which I put in on the next slide. Uh -huh. uh, you know, everyone knows Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream as you know the uh, fairy king and queen's jester, and that he's this you know, funny little guy who likes to play pranks on people. But in the Neil Gaiman version, uh, he is the king's jester because Oberon thinks it's hilarious how scared everyone is of Puck because look at him. And so he gives- it's pretty scary. Yeah, in both the play <laughs> and the comic book, Puck has the last word. And, uh, this, and so it gives, you know, this, Shakespeare's words about I hope you enjoyed the play and uh good night unto you all uh to this horrifying little goblin thing. <laughs> oh yeah. So here is a great panel by the legendary P. Craig Russell, who I think is involved in the ZCOM. Okay, great. Oh, that's yeah. gonna be amazing. P. Craig Russell, an amazing artist. Um uh Ramadan, what is this story about? This one is about uh Arun al-Rashid, who is the Caliph of Baghdad, and he was a real, uh, he was a real prince in the, I think, 8th or ninth century, and he repeatedly shows up in uh, the Thousand and One Arabian Nights, but uh, in the story, he lives in this mythical uh, Baghdad of, you know, genies and flying carpets and all of this magic, and uh, he calls the dream lord and asks, he wants to uh, make, he offers to sell him his city and make sure that it endures forever. Mm. And, you know, and so this magical world that he lived in and ruled over, it does uh, live on still, but not exactly the way that Harun had in mind. 
Now, I think at this time, Salmon 50 was about 96, 97. So you're kind of out of the back end of the, of the front end of the, the dark age of comics. We're getting kind of more of the commercial age of it. But you can kind of see here that this is what, you know, if the 80s were defined by um, all the Batman stuff, Frank Miller stuff, and then Craven's Last Hunt, which is a dark Spider-Man story, and then all the dark Avenger stuff under Siege. Then you've got this book over here, and this is why Sandman is so incredible. You, you open this book up, you see this scene, and it's two characters talking about the meaning of existence and the place in the world and what it means to have dreams. Um, you can kind of see how this stood out so much during um, comic books. And in fact, um, let me see the next panel, I'm just going to cue this up here. Um, oh, yes, okay. So in fact, um, I'm, that, that's let's get that. That's a horrible handle we can look at. Uh, so in fact, this is what I'm getting to. So uh, one of the things that Neil Gaiman is credited for doing is when Sandman first appeared, the line of 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 fans were mostly men because that's who went to comic book conventions. But as the series rolled on, more and more women started showing up in the lines. And more women uh, were becoming fans and they were expressing their interest in what they wanted to see in the stories. And this is Karen Berger. She's the creator of Vertigo Comics and uh, along with Jeanette Kahn helped bring in the modern era of comics um, through Vertigo. Um, yeah. And um, Sandman was originally published by DC and then it went very quickly to Vertigo, which was a subsidiary. Yes. And I didn't realize that uh, until I was studying up for this, that uh, Vertigo's very first book was actually, uh, I think it was uh, Time of Your Life, the uh, spinoff about death. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. um, so, yeah, so Vertigo started in 1993 under the stewardship of Karen Berger here. Um, and uh, so in the mid eighties, like I said before, she uh, began recruiting writers from the UK, including Neil Gaiman, um, Alan Moore, uh, Graham Morrison. Really um, she found their sensibility and point of view to be refreshingly different, edgier and smarter. Mm. Um, so the first lineup of DC books, Animal Man, Doom Patrol, Shade the Chain of Man, uh, Sandman, of course, Hellblazer, they brought Saga Swamp Thing over, as well as Kid Eternity, Black Orchid, which was Neil Gaiman's first work for DC before Sandman. Um, these six original titles all carried a suggested for mature readers label, and they shared a sophistication-driven sensibility the comics and fans dubbed the Burgerverse. Um, so the point of the Burgerverse was to make comics grow up. And one of the things that the... Um, that Karen Berger did is kind of defined by her background there. When women came to the lines at these comic book conventions, um, like many of you, they read novels and books. And so comics are 22 pages. You can read it in 15 minutes and you're done. Um, they wanted more substantial reading materials. So what they started doing was collecting them in trade paperback formats where they take six books, put them together, sell them at a bookstore, so they could get to the mass market. Um, so all these books you see here behind you and the majority of sales we have in the store are because of the leadership of Jeanette Kahn bringing Karen Berger in, Karen Berger understanding what readers wanted. So women helped create and redefine the mostly male-driven uh, comic medium and gave us uh, trade paperbacks which saved the industry, as a matter of fact. Um, and in fact, so I, I, there's, a, there's a little quote here. So in fact, at the time, I think women only composed about 53% um, of comic book readers in, in, a, in a poll done in 2015 are women, up from 40% in 2012. And yeah, so we were going to talk a little bit about a couple of other uh, sort of post Sandman books mm -hmm. that have been influenced. Uh, well, well, actually, let me, let me stop here. So, so two things happened with Sandman really quickly. So, graphic novels, more women became involved, 
And something that had never been done before in comics was Neil Gaiman said, I'm going to end Sandman and I don't want you to continue on afterwards. At the time, uh, Sandman was the cash juggernaut for DC Comics. It had never been done before. In fact, the comics they end up doing is they just drive that character in the ground until they can squeeze every last dollar out of them by wherever mm -hmm. they are. Karen Berger and the creators of DC Comics knew that Sandman was Neil Gaiman and it was too special to go on without him. So they ended the book in, with, after issue 75. And uh, from there, it was, uh, it was the era after Sandman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, well, and of course, it was about this time, you know, Neil Gaiman moved on to other things too mm -hmm. because he wrote. Uh, at the time, while he was writing uh, Sandman, he wrote a total of three novels. And so the first one was Good Omens, which he co-wrote with Terry Pratchett. And then in 96, he wrote his first solo novel of Neverwhere, and also a uh, BBC miniseries, which was based on Never on the book. Mm -hmm. And then in 1998, he published uh, Stardust, which is one of our slew campus reads. And in some versions, including right here, I noticed. I, it's funny I is, noticed. Uh, uh, illustrated by the great artist Charles Bess, who also did a lot of uh, uh, Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that. And he also did a lot of uh, Sandman. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think he did uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. But I, Oh yeah, could remember be. that. Yeah. But <laughs> um, and then after Sandman, he started on uh, his first really big hit was American Gods in two thousand one, and which has a lot of the same themes of you know this very eclectic pulling in people, you know, characters and ideas from all over. And in two thousand eight. Uh, his young adult novel, The Graveyard's Book, which is our other slew campus read. And then in uh, 2009 and 10 uh, or so was when he had uh, the animated version of his book Coraline and also the movie of Stardust, which is a uh, really good movie with uh, Charlie Cox, the guy who plays Derek. Very underrated film. Very yeah. Nice. And now in the last five years, uh, three of his uh, books have been made into TV shows. So American Gods, and then Good Omens, and now The Sandman. Yes. So been, what a rifle in the game. And he's been a busy guy for yeah. the last few years. And then during this whole time too, so in the early 90s, uh, Neil Gaiman, of course, juggernaut that was Sandman, he goes on to work on only one other title at the time that I know of that's not his work, uh, I, with a character called Angela from uh, a Spawn title where showing his mastery of comics, with one issue, he was able to create an entire universe from which Tom McFarlane could pull um, his main character Spawn, who was the biggest character in the 90s, and create this whole universe. Unbeknownst to him, Tom McFarlane didn't pay Neil Gaiman for the work. So when Tom McFarlane was being sued here in St. Louis in the mid late nineties and in the uh, early two thousands, Neil Gaiman had to come and uh, testify before the lawsuit uh, claiming about you know, Tom McFarlane's inability to pay uh, royalties or respect copyrights. Uh, that's a whole other story that I'll tell you about a much other time, but it's a hilarious story. Um, um, so at the time, Neil Gaiman, um, Two big things are happening in comics at the time. One is that the speculator market and the collector's market is growing. The death of Superman in 1982 um, brought in creator, brought in comic fans who hadn't been in stores in decades. They all thought Superman was going to die and they wanted to have that book. Uh, the death of Superman was the top selling comic uh, for decades. Um, and so it led to the, the creators and sorry, the collector's market, which then forced creators, uh, comic book companies, to publish so many books, it flooded the market, killed the collectability of any comics, and almost caused the destruction of both Marvel and DC comics at the same time because they were so over leveraged, the product nobody would buy. Um, so that's where, and you know, Neil Gaiman was able to come back in 2003 
to write uh, two stories, one, actually two stories from Marvel, The Eternals, which is what the Eternals movie was based on, and Marvel 1602. Um, but I think the longest things, we, I, I, since we're kind of running along on time here, the longest effect that Sandman had was bringing more British creators, uh, including Mark Millar, Warren Ellis, which led to the explosion of superhero movies uh, like The Ultimates, which was based, which is what the Avengers movies were based on. And they drew uh, by another British artist, Brian Hitch, uh, Nick Fury to look like Samuel Jackson, the comics. So when they were casting the movies, they just hired Samuel Jackson, Jackson to be Nick Fury in the movies. Yeah. Really, really. And another one that started about the same time by another British writer is Planetary by Warren Ellis, which is one of my all time favorites. Mm -hmm. And so it's, they call themselves, the organization Planetary called themselves Arche or Archaeologists of the Unknown. And they go around uncovering all of this crazy stuff in 1999 that happened all through the 20th century. And so this is the cover of the last issue. And you can see all around them, there's references to uh, the two old guys above the Y in Planetary are Dracula and Sherlock Holmes. There's Mothra. There's a uh, Superman cape, and there's characters who are, you know, very thinly disguised versions of uh, Tarzan and the Lone Ranger and the Shadow and the Green Hornet and a bunch of other characters that they've crossed their paths with of just, you know, their job as superhero archaeologists looking back at the whole 20th century, like, what just happened? Well, kind of like Nick, uh, Nick Fury, kind of like a Neil um, Gaiman. Planetary is a story about uh, stories too, and yeah. it's kind of they kind of dive into mythology. Mm -hmm. I talked about the Ultimates there too, yeah. uh, one of the great books of all time. But one of the, the lasting effects, and we're going to get to Q and A here really quick. But um, the, the two biggest kind of effects of Sandman were that a um, Brought comics into the meat into pop culture, more accepted into uh, uh, you know fandoms, and with the creation of books like uh, Harry Potter, uh, Hunger Games, um, it led people to understand the importance of anthology uh, novelization. So you know, it, just like comics, every month you got a new book, you got a new story. With Harry Potter. And all the other stories that came around there, every couple months, every couple of years, you had a new story to come out. So they follow that same path and kind of made the comicization of novels um, more important. But the biggest thing I think about Sandman was that when you look at the, the range of comics, we started in the 1940s with how man affects the world around them to the 1950s, which how man kind of uh, or how American culture uh, distracts themselves from the terrors around them by creating terror that they can understand, to how do they uh, battle these things that they don't understand with science and things that are stronger than them, to falling back to the 1960s where it's about uh, American superiority and powerful, to then 1970s where America has to look at introspection about what it's done to itself to the 1980s where you look at um, Americans are confronting the fact and the British are too with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan is do we have too much power are we really using it wisely to where we're at now in comics with because of things of Sandman where we looked introspectively and we said you know into the world around us and our belief structures about what we were creating um, and what our dreams did to the world around us. So it, it kind of went from what we can touch to what's inside of us. And it's all, um, you know, that, that's kind of the theme of American mythology. Mm -hmm. um, so that, to me, Drew, if you want to sum up about what is the, the, the lasting impact of Sammy and how important it is, bringing it to popular culture, bringing more women into the work, into the, the um, meeting well. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's very much that and, you know, making comics, you know, the 80s, the dark ages when comics stopped being seen, stopped being basically dumb, disposable kids entertainment. Yes, yeah. And, you know, 
trying to be a serious art form and that, you know, the Sandman is real literature. And it's, you know, I mean, I would argue that it's as much literature as anything I had to read in high school. When I was, and, when I was a kid, I went to comic book stores and the Sandman was in the back. That was like AP comics. I was like, I'm not going to near that. I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, it proved that, you know, it could be a real art form and it could be real literature. And, you know, it could talk about, you know, the same themes and have, you know, be structured like a Greek tragedy and, you know, have all of this, you know, mythological stuff in it mm -hmm. and be serious and, you know, and really beautiful art that, you know, and yeah, I think it, you know, more than anything else probably proved that, you know, comics are a, a serious art form. I never bought a work of art in my entire life that wasn't a comic book. I, don't hang, I didn't hang anything on my walls until I got married. Uh, so with that, uh, let's turn it over to you guys. See if there's any questions you have about anything we talked about tonight, anything, any questions you have about comics, any trivia you want to throw out our way, um, any points you want to bring up? Ma'am? Yeah, uh, thank you, by the way. It's very interesting for someone who is not a fan. Uh, I don't read a lot of comic books, but I, I'm starting to read more. But I'm interested in the process. Uh, when does the illustrator meet the writer, and how closely do they work together? Uh, so the question was, how closely do the writer and artist work together? Um, the writer will write the comment, will write the script, They'll send it to the uh, artist. They'll talk and uh, talk about each panel and talk about each page. You know, what, what are you thinking you want to do here? The artist will then draw it, what he interprets the page to be. Then they'll talk to the writer about, if this is kind of where you think I should go here. And depending on how much freedom the writer wants to give the artist or you know, vice versa, um, will determine where the book goes. Uh, there was another method in the 1960s when Stan Lee was writing, writing, uh, about 15 books at the time, it was called the Marvel Method. And what he would do is Stanley would say, all right, page one, I need Spider-Man to zoom in. Page two, he's going to grow problems. Page three, there's a monster. Page four, there's a monster. Page five, there's another monster. Page six, he has dinner with Anne May. And then what happened is that the, the artist would draw that sequence of pages. And so how does, how's Peter Parker going to get from this one to this one? And then he'd send it to Stan Lee and Stan would then write in the word bubbles about what each person was saying, um, which is insane, but yeah. it's it, it same it, time. But when you're doing like six of these things at a time every month, yeah, that's about how you have to do it. And, and, oh, sorry. Oh, and I was gonna say, yeah, and some, I know it varies, and some writers, I believe, including Neil Gaiman, will do very detailed, where it's almost like a screenplay mm -hmm. for the uh, artist to work through. And I've seen one of his uh, Sandman scripts somewhere a long time ago. And yeah, where it is very detailed of, okay, this will be a, you know, six page or six panels on this page. And in the first one, we see this, this, and this. And, you know, and then the second panel, you can see Dream, you know, it's a close up of Dream's face and he's starting to get frustrated with this conversation and he wants this to end. So, and then and he says this and the third panel is that and mm -hmm. yeah you know and there's this commentary of you know and you can see and here the person he's talking to is mean and old and doesn't want to deal with him either and so and that's all the yeah. feedback you will give any other questions so the, I, there is kind of interesting about the comic book layout as well as that so there's kind of a team of maybe four or five people who work there's a writer there's the artist there's the anchor which also is known as a, uh, you could insult them and call them a tracer. And then there's the colorist. And then you've got the guy who does the word, who does the, the letterer. And each one of those people, how they apply their craft greatly changes the direction of the comic. If you were to do a, if you were to add more tracing on each character, you'd add more shading, you could add more <laughs> intention, more, um, you know, nuance to the character's face. You can change their reaction, how they, they face. You can use colors to drastically change the emotion of the page or kind of what time of day it is, where the setting is. The letterer is, is, is responsible for bolding words that need to be shouted. 
Um, so it, it's an amazing team effort that has to go into creating each comic book. Um, and not a lot of people really think about it, but every, every one of them is an artist in their own right. And uh, they affect it in, in a wide variety of ways. Yeah. And actually with letterers, Sandman is a great example of how, you know, it seems like something that's not that important, but here, you know, you can, and this is a great example of where comics can do things that, you know, art or literature can't do on their own. Yeah. Of uh, like all of Dream's word bubbles are, uh, you know, instead of just the little white circle with the arrow pointing at their mouth, there are these globby black things with white lettering on a black background. And, you know, just as a way of showing what he talks like. Or there's one scene I always remember where, uh, he, where he meets angels and they talk in cursive. And uh, yeah, so like, that's like a thing where like the the uh, reader has to interpret what that means, what that sounds like. It's going to sound a hundred different ways to each person. Mm -hmm. Upsettingly, in the show, they made him sound like just a regular jerk. But I would be great if we were to figure that out. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how you make someone talk in black on white or uh, yeah, white text on black, 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 black background. Black. But Anybody but can? Yeah. this is uh, kind of tangential to it. Sure. But when you're talking about the uh, uh, the comic comic code or comic code association, whatever it was. Comic code authority. Yeah, yeah. comic code authority. Mm -hmm. How similar that was to the Hollywood production. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, with, you know, the Hayes office, which started in the 1930s. Those trials were going off. The, well, maybe. Well, well they, they started yeah. in the 1930s. Oh, she was 20 years before. But when you think, but they both fell in the late 1960s. Yeah. You know, with, with movies like Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when I think about it, I, I think it's that by the 1930s, movies had, had just had had about one generation of of, of popularity. Yeah. Between silence and the beginning of, of sound. And comics came 20 years later. So it makes sense that that this sort of regulation would be would occur at those different periods, but you know, about the same point in the life cycle of each of each uh, uh, of each art form. Yeah. I mean so you have the pioneers who created, then you have the followers of them who kind of add on to it. And then you've got the next line, they keep adding on to it. And that's kind of what happened with, with, uh, with comics in the 1930s uh, and 30s. You had the kids who were fans of the science magazines, and they yeah. started adding uh, uh, pictures to those comics. And then in the Silver Age, you had the kids that, that you know, liked the Golden Age stuff, and they remembered it, so they made their characters a little bit different. And then when those kids in the 60s started writing comics in the 80s, they added a whole new thing to it. And... Uh, I mean, it's really, you know, it, and they added more and more detail to it. It's it pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, one question from the online audience. Were these comics like Archie and the Pan and Ventures or Sabrina Fall? Where do Archie, the question is, where do Archie and the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina? Uh, so uh, right at the beginning and all the way through. So um, Archie Comics is uh, one of the longest running uh, title, well, not titles, but uh, uh, properties and comics. So Archie started in about early early 1940s, uh, right after the war as American Boy, American Town. Um, and then Sabrina, I think, happened maybe in the 1950s or 60s. Um, but that's a great, uh, those two characters are great examples of longevity of comics and how they constantly re, uh, reinvent themselves. Uh, now, Archie is as is, is big as ever. Um, he's got it. The Riverdale's a successful TV show. Uh, Sabrina's a successful TV show, and they've kind of like they've got eighty years of a kid being a teenager, so they've <laughs> kind of done away with continuity and they just put out whatever they want. So um, uh, they were great. Yeah, it's a good example of that sort of sliding timeline. Is oh yeah, in comics where you know they can because comic book characters don't age, uh, they can stay. You know. Archie can stay in, uh, you know, can stay in high school, even though he could essentially be his own grandfather at this point. Yeah, I'm in favor of characters aging and retiring and going away. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. But, you know, 